Introduction Moonlight seeps through the dense canopy of the evergreen thicket, casting a silver glow that barely touches the forest floor, tangled with shadows that seem to writhe in the cool Georgia night. Amongst the ancient trees, a figure dashes, his lab coat billowing like a ghostly banner, stained with dark splotches that whisper of terror and regret. This frantic spectre is Dr. Julian Harrow, whose once celebrated genius now propels him through the thicket's embrace, away from a horror of his own making. Every labored breath he draws is a gasp of fear, his footsteps a desperate cadence in the night's haunting symphony. Blood, his own, marks a crimson trail behind him, a macabre breadcrumb path back to the genesis of his nightmare. The forest around him is alive, not just with the natural sounds of nocturnal creatures, but with an added layer of malevolence, as if the trees themselves whisper warnings of the folly of man's hubris. Julian's eyes dart to every movement in the periphery, every shadow that seems to shift of its own accord, his heart hammering against his ribs as he imagines his creation lurking within every darkened nook. A sudden, bone-chilling howl shatters the relative peace of the forest, freezing Julian in his tracks. It's a sound not meant for the human ear, a grotesque symphony of all the dark promises of the night, embodying the terror that now hunts him. His creation, a twisted mockery of life, born from a desire to conquer nature's most sacred laws, now stalks its creator with relentless, unseen malice. For a moment, Julian leans heavily against a moss-covered oak, its ancient bark rough under his trembling hands. The revolver, pulled from the depths of his coat, gleams dully in the moonlight, a stark reminder of the choices that led him here. Two bullets. They seem laughably insufficient against the abomination that haunts him, yet they are all he has to cling to, a final, desperate bid for redemption or perhaps mere survival. As he pushes off from the tree, casting a wary glance into the impenetrable darkness, Julian's flight continues. The evergreen thicket is no longer just a forest but a labyrinthine prison, echoing with the consequences of his actions. Chapter 1 Ethan Carter's hands grip the steering wheel as if it were a lifeline, the only thing anchoring him to the present as his mind spiraled into a vortex of regret and self-loathing. The road stretched before him, an endless black ribbon through the night, illuminated only by the occasional streetlight passing in a blow. The low hum of the car engine was a constant reminder of his journey back to a reality he wished he could escape. The radio played softly in the background, a melancholic tune that seemed to mock his predicament. Each note was a piercing reminder of the deceit he had done, a haunting melody that underscored his guilt. How fitting, Ethan thought bitterly, as he glanced at the dashboard, only to see the gaslight glowing ominously. Just another punishment, he muttered to himself, a scornful laugh escaping his lips. The universe seemed to have a cruel sense of humor tonight. As the miles wore on, Ethan's thoughts turned inward, a relentless tide of self-recrimination washing over him. He had always prided himself on being a good man, a loyal husband. Yet, here he was, driving back from an illicit encounter with his boss, Angela, the woman with whom he had betrayed not only his wife, Diane, but their unborn child as well. The shame was suffocating, a heavy cloak that threatened to consume him. He couldn't even remember how it had happened. One moment, the two of them were celebrating a successful business deal at the bar. And the next, lines were crossed, boundaries blurred. And Ethan found himself making love to a woman that was not his wife. It was as if he had been watching himself from a distance, powerless to stop the inevitable unraveling of his morals. How did I become this person? he questioned, his voice a mere whisper lost in the confines of the car. The affair had been a mistake, a moment of weakness he could never take back. Angela had been persuasive, alluring, but that was no excuse. He knew better. He should have been stronger. Diane, sweet Diane, with her unwavering faith and love, deserved so much more than the betrayal he had served her. The thought of her, at home, waiting for him, filled with dreams of their future together as a family, made his heart ache. I have to come clean to Diane, he mummers under his guilty breath. As the guilt threatened to overwhelm him, a faint light in the distance caught his eye, a beacon in the darkness. Grateful for the distraction, Ethan focused on it, driving towards the promise of respite. 
The light grew, revealing a gas station that seemed to have been plucked straight from the 1970s, a relic amidst the shadows. He pulled in, the gravel crunching under the tires, and stopped beside one of the pumps. On the other side, another vehicle lurked in the semi-darkness, its passenger shrouded in shadow, an anonymous witness to his pit stop. Ethan paid them no mind, his thoughts consumed by the turmoil within. As he stepped out of his car, the night air hit Ethan like a cold slap. The gas station's fluorescent lights flickered above, casting long shadows that danced across the pavement, making the scene feel eerily detached from the world he knew. He paused for a moment, the weight of his guilt and the night's revelations pressing heavily on his chest. The decision to come clean to Diane about his affair loomed over him, a daunting spectre that threatened to consume his every thought. As Ethan made his way past the adjacent car, he caught a glimpse of the passenger inside, a young girl with striking green hair and a nose piercing. She seemed out of place in the dimly lit surroundings, her nervous fidgeting and averted gaze betraying her unease. Ethan gave her a brief glance, noting her discomfort, but his own turmoil clouded his judgment, rendering him indifferent to her presence. Pushing the door open, the bell's cheerful ring contrasted sharply with the tension that awaited him inside. Two men stood at the counter, the clerk, a man whose nervous smile failed to mask his apprehension, and a hooded figure Ethan instinctively pegged as the girl's boyfriend. The air inside was thick with unspoken tension, a prelude to the chaos that would soon unfold. With a nod to the clerk, Ethan tried to dismiss the uneasy feeling that had settled in his stomach. He moved past the pair, his mind a whirlwind of regret and self-recrimination. The affair with Angela, a mistake that had spiraled out of control, now threatened not just his marriage but his entire future. He had always considered himself a man of integrity, but the night's events had shattered that illusion, leaving him to question who he really was. The coolers at the back of the store offered a momentary distraction from his inner turmoil. Ethan scanned the selection of energy drinks and sodas, each colorful can promising a burst of vitality he so desperately needed. Yet, even as he pondered his choice, his thoughts drifted back to Angela, her tears, her pleas for him not to leave as he ran out of her hotel room, the realization of the depth of his betrayal. He sighed heavily. Then, in the reflection of the overhead mirror, Ethan's night took another dramatic turn. It was a glance upwards, a habitual check in the overhead mirror meant to survey the store, that shattered his momentary distraction. The reflection offered Ethan a clear, albeit brief, glimpse of the situation unfolding at the counter. The young man, previously just a hooded figure of suspicion, now revealed his true intentions. Ethan's eyes widened as he caught sight of the gun, a stark, menacing presence in the robber's hand. For a fraction of a second, the weapon was aimed directly at the clerk, a silent but unmistakable threat. The robber's other hand, free and emphatic, gestured for silence and compliance. The clerk, a picture of forced calm, nodded subtly, his eyes wide with fear. A surge of adrenaline shot through Ethan. The reality of the situation hit him like a physical blow, the store wasn't just the scene of his internal reckoning, it was the stage for a far more immediate and dangerous drama. Panic nodded in Ethan's stomach as he realized the necessity of calling the police. With a sense of urgency, he slid his hand into his pocket, searching for his phone. He moved from one pocket to the next, his movements becoming more frantic as the reality set in, his phone was not on him. A flash of memory, the image of his phone sitting on the passenger seat of his car, taunted him. The realization left him feeling even more isolated, cut off from any immediate help. Ethan struggled to maintain a facade of calm as panic clawed at his insides. The weight of his earlier personal turmoil now seemed inconsequential compared to the imminent threat facing him and the innocent clerk. He was alone, unarmed, and unprepared for a confrontation of this nature. Yet, as his mind raced, evaluating and discarding options, Ethan understood that inaction was a choice he couldn't live with. The guilt of his personal failings was enough to bear without adding cowardice or failure to act in the face of danger to the list. Determined yet desperate, Ethan grasped a can of soda from the top shelf of the cooler, his mind working overtime to devise a plan. 
How had a night that began with personal regret and a quest for redemption spiraled into this harrowing ordeal? The irony was not lost on him, in seeking to right one wrong, he had inadvertently stepped into a maelstrom of moral ambiguity and danger. With deliberate caution, Ethan approached the counter, the can of coke now a makeshift weapon in his improvised plan. The reflection in the overhead mirror had revealed more than just the store's layout, it had exposed the imminent danger posed by the young robber. His heart hammered against his ribcage, each beat a reminder of the peril he was about to confront. In a moment that felt suspended in time, Ethan shook the can vigorously, the pressurized contents awaiting release. He aimed and popped the tab, unleashing a spray of soda that flew across the air, targeting the robber. The fizzy onslaught hit its mark, momentarily disorienting the assailant and providing Ethan the split-second advantage he needed. Seizing the opportunity, Ethan lunged forward, using the momentum to tackle the young man to the ground. The two of them crashed into a nearby display, the impact sending items scattering across the floor as well as the gun. They grappled in a desperate struggle, Ethan's determination clashing with the robber's surprise and growing anger. Ethan knew it was only a matter of seconds before the young man overpowered him. Grab the gun! Ethan yelled out, hoping the clerk would seize the opportunity to disarm the assailant. The clerk stood there in frozen fear and shock lost in the chaos before him. It was then that the situation took another dramatic turn. The green haired girl, previously a silent observer from the shadows of the car, burst into the store. Her appearance was as striking as her sudden involvement, nervousness etched into her features, her hands trembling as she aimed a gun at Ethan. Get off him, she yelled, her voice cracking with the strain of authority and fear. The hesitation in her stance betrayed her inexperience, yet the danger she presented was unmistakably real. Ethan froze, the urgency in the girl's voice cutting through the chaos. The sight of her, green hair illuminated under the harsh fluorescent lights, gun wavering in her unsteady grip, was a jarring reminder of the unpredictability of the night. Her nervousness, mirrored in the tremble of her lips and the wide, fearful eyes, underscored the desperation of the moment. Compliance was Ethan's only option. Slowly, he disentangled himself from the young robber, each movement measured under the watchful, scared gaze of the green-haired girl. As he backed away, his hands raised in a universal sign of surrender, Ethan's mind raced with the implications of his actions. The attempt to take control of the situation, to act in the face of injustice, had escalated the stakes far beyond his initial comprehension. The young robber, now free from Ethan's grasp, scrambled to his feet, his rage palpable. The dynamic in the room shifted, the balance of power teetering on the edge of the girl's unsteady hands. Ethan, bruised and breathing heavily, could only watch as the young man regained his composure, the threat of violence looming larger than ever. As the girl commanded Ethan to stand aside, her voice betraying her inner turmoil, the reality of his situation became clear. The robber, still visibly seething from the unexpected confrontation, paused to wipe his mouth. His hand came away with blood, a stark red against his skin, evidence of the physical altercation that had just unfolded. The realization seemed to fuel his anger further, but it was the cocky smirk that followed which truly foretold the impending violence. It was a look of regained control, a silent declaration that he would not be bested. Without warning, the young man's fist flew towards Ethan, connecting with a force that sent him sprawling to the floor. The impact of the punch, followed by the hard surface against his skull, left Ethan dazed and defenseless. The robber, emboldened and enraged, unleashed a barrage of kicks, targeting Ethan with a ferocity that seemed to go beyond mere retaliation. With each kick, a string of expletives filled the air, the robber berating Ethan for his audacity to intervene. You think you brave, huh? The robber jeered, his voice echoing off the store's walls as he delivered another punishing blow. Ethan, curled into a ball on the ground, tried to shield himself from the assault, the pain from each hit merging into a continuous wave of agony. It was then that the green-haired girl, who had been standing aside in a state of frozen shock, finally found her voice. Jason, stop it, she screamed, her voice cutting through the haze of violence. 
Her use of the robber's name, her plea laden with desperation, momentarily pierced the bubble of rage that surrounded him. Jason paused, his chest heaving with exertion and anger. With one final act of defiance, he spat on Ethan, the saliva landing with a demeaning splat on Ethan's cheek. Wimp, he sneered, stepping back as if to admire the result of his handiwork. The violence ceased as suddenly as it had begun, leaving a tense silence in its wake. Ethan lay on the cold floor, every breath a testament to the pain that racked his body. His side and ribs throbbed with an intensity that made even the slightest movement a torture. The physical pain was overwhelming, but it was the realization of his helplessness in the situation that truly weighed on him. The green-haired girl's intervention, though late, was a small mercy in the storm of violence that had engulfed Ethan. As he lay there, trying to process the pain and the rapid turn of events, Ethan understood the complexity of the situation they were all entangled in, a web of desperation, fear, and misguided attempts at control. Elsewhere, under the oppressive cloak of night, Dr. Julian Harrow fled through the dense forest, each labored breath and desperate stride carried the weight of his guilt, a burden far heavier than the blood he was losing from the wound that marred his side. His white lab coat, once a symbol of his scientific pursuit and integrity, now hung from his body in tattered, blood-soaked shreds, evidence of the horror he had unleashed upon the world. As the night air cut through him, chilling his bones, Julian's mind was a whirlwind of panic and remorse. The creature that howled in the darkness behind him, a living nightmare that he could neither see nor fully comprehend, was his creation, a testament to his arrogance, his reckless ambition to transcend the boundaries of nature and play God. Now, as he fled from the consequences of his actions, Julian couldn't help but curse himself for the folly that had brought this devil into existence. Why? he gasped, the question a whisper lost among the trees. What have I done? The realization of his responsibility was a poison, seeping through his veins more lethal than the physical wound he bore. Julian knew he had crossed a line from which there was no return. In his pursuit of knowledge and power, he had ignored the ethical boundaries that should have guided his work. Now, the world would suffer for his crimes, for the abomination he had created. The howling grew more distant, yet it echoed louder in Julian's conscience, a haunting reminder of his failure. As he pushed forward, driven by a primal instinct to survive, his thoughts turned dark. This is my punishment, he reasoned, every painful step a penance for his arrogance. But how many others will pay for my sins? The pursuit seemed endless, a nightmarish chase that Julian feared had only one conclusion. Yet, as despair threatened to engulf him, a glimmer of hope pierced the darkness. The gas station, with its promise of light and human presence, appeared through the trees ahead, an unlikely sanctuary in his moment of utter desolation. With the last vestiges of his strength, Julian pressed on, driven by the faint hope that he might find refuge, if not redemption, within its walls. A brief respite, he thought, even as he understood the futility of escaping the broader consequences of his actions. The light of the gas station was a beacon, drawing him closer, yet it offered no true escape from the horror he had created. Chapter 2 In the aftermath of the confrontation, Ethan, battered and bruised, remained on the floor, his body a map of pain from Jason's relentless assault. Above him, Jason stood with a smug satisfaction, reveling in his perceived victory. He swaggered back to Sophie, who still aimed the gun at Ethan and Harold, the clerk, whose hands were still held high in a gesture of surrender. Stand up, Jason demanded, his tone dripping with disdain. When Ethan didn't immediately respond, Jason's command came again, sharper and filled with a venomous impatience. With great effort and amidst a chorus of aches from his ribs, Ethan pushed himself to his feet, each movement a testament to the ordeal he had just endured. Jason's mockery was immediate. Still feeling like a hero, he taunted, his laughter a harsh sound in the quiet of the gas station. It was a cruel jibe, aimed to wound as much as his physical blows had. Sophie, meanwhile, looked on, her discomfort evident in her tense posture and wide eyes. She was clearly out of her depth, the gravity of the situation pressing down on her. Jason, unfazed by her distress, turned his malice towards Ethan once more. 
heroics of their price, he sneered, then turned to Sophie with a chilling command, shoot him. Sophie's response was a mix of shock and hesitation. What? She managed, her voice thin with disbelief. Her hands trembled visibly, the gun now a heavy weight in her grasp. Losing patience, Jason snatched the weapon from her, deriding her as useless. Pointing the gun at Ethan, he asked mockingly. Still brave? Ethan's thoughts flew to wife and unborn child, a silent prayer for their safety and well-being as he faced down the barrel of the gun. The atmosphere was thick with tension, the threat of violence hanging heavy in the air. Harold and Sophie, caught in the moment, could only stand frozen, their fears rendering them silent observers to Ethan's potential fate. Just as the moment seemed to stretch to its breaking point, the entrance bell rang sharply. Dr. Julian Harrow, his appearance a startling intrusion, stumbled through the doors. His lab coat was torn, his body marked by grievous wounds, and his plea for help was a weak whisper before he collapsed, blood pooling around him. In the distraction, Harold acted. He grabbed a beer bottle and, with a decisive swing, brought it down on Jason's head. The robber fell, unconscious, his grip on the gun loosening as it clattered to the floor. This time, Harold quickly secured the gun, his voice firm as he ordered Sophie to back away. Despite her shock at Jason's sudden downfall, she complied, her hands raised in a clear sign of surrender. Ethan, despite his injuries, moved to Julian's side, the doctor's wounds stark and alarming. Ethan's call for help was hesitant at first, directed at Sophie, who was clearly torn between the fear of reprisal and the urge to assist. After a moment of indecision, her humanity overcame her fear, and she knelt beside Ethan, their efforts focused on stemming Julian's bleeding. This act of cooperation, under Ethan's guidance, was a fragile truce, their mutual goal to save a life momentarily bridging the chasm of their earlier conflict. Sophie's initial reluctance faded as she followed Ethan's instructions, her actions tentative but determined. The severity of Julian's injuries was unlike anything she had ever faced, and her distress was evident in the tremble of her hands and the tears that spilled over her cheeks. Will he be okay? She asked, her voice breaking, a stark contrast to the bravado she had displayed under Jason's influence. Ethan's response was measured, uncertain. The task at hand was grim, their efforts a desperate bid against the odds. As they worked, the gas station, a place of transient anonymity, had become the scene of an unexpected alliance. Unseen by the trio, Jason had regained his senses once more. Slowly, consciousness crept back into Jason, his mind a whirlwind of confusion and anger as he pieced together the events that had led to his downfall. The throbbing pain at the side of his head served as a cruel reminder of his momentary lapse in control, a vulnerability he despised. As his senses sharpened, the sight that greeted him fueled a new surge of betrayal and rage. Sophie, his girlfriend, the one he had dragged into this mess under the guise of loyalty and love, was now kneeling beside Ethan, aiding the very man he had deemed his adversary. In Jason's twisted perspective, this was the ultimate betrayal, a transgression that rendered Sophie no longer an asset but a liability. Her actions, dictated by a basic human instinct to help, were lost on him, he saw only disloyalty in her willingness to assist Ethan. The realization struck Jason with clarity amidst his disorientation. Sophie's usefulness had ended the moment she chose to side with Ethan, even if it was just to save a life. In his mind, warped by anger and a sense of ownership over her, Sophie's defiance was unforgivable. She had chosen her side, and in doing so, had become as much of an enemy to him as Ethan and Harold. With the cold logic of survival dictating his next moves, Jason assessed his options. The gun, now in Harold's shaky grip, and the wounded doctor on the floor momentarily forgotten, Jason saw his opportunity to escape. His body, driven by a blend of desperation and survival instinct, moved with a sudden burst of energy. He pushed himself off the floor, his eyes locked on the door that promised freedom. The moment of his escape was a blow, a desperate dash for the exit that left no room for hesitation. As he passed Sophie, the sense of betrayal that Jason felt was apparent, a silent accusation thrown at her even as he fled. 
her shock at his abandonment, her hurt visible even in the brief moment their eyes met, was a detail lost in the chaos of his escape. Jason's departure was a calculated risk, a gambler's last throw of the dice in a game that had spiraled out of his control. The cold night air hit him as he burst through the doors, the sounds of the gas station fading behind him as he made his bid for freedom. The betrayal he felt, twisted by his own delusions, justified his actions in his mind, leaving no room for remorse or reflection on the chaos he had left in his wake. Sophie, her face a mask of shock and dismay, couldn't conceal her astonishment at his sudden departure. Harold, momentarily emboldened by his earlier act of bravery, rushed to the door, gun in hand, prepared to confront or possibly halt Jason's retreat. But the night had other plans. As Harold reached the threshold, a chilling sequence unfolded, a shadow, vast and swift, enveloped Jason. His scream, a piercing sound of raw terror, was abruptly cut off, leaving a haunting silence in its wake. In the blink of an eye, the predator and its prey vanished, leaving behind only a dark, ominous stain beneath the gas station's lights, a silent testament to the horror that had occurred. Harold staggered back, the gun slipping from his grasp and clattering to the floor. His complexion drained of color. Sophie, her nerves frayed and heart pounding with apprehension, rushed alongside Ethan to the door, only to be confronted with a quiet and desolate scene. The stark glow of the gas station lights revealed a grim tableau, an empty patch of pavement, ominously marked by a dark stain of blood, but devoid of any sign of Jason or his assailant. Behind them, Harold had succumbed to his fear, with a look of sheer terror etched into his features. The pistol lay discarded by his side, a forgotten relic of their fleeting sense of security. Sophie, her mind racing with the worst possibilities, turned back from the haunting emptiness outside to face Harold. With tears streaming down her face and her voice choked with fear and desperation, she demanded an explanation. What happened to Jason? Tell me. Her plea tore through the silence, a raw expression of the need to understand the unimaginable fate that had befallen Jason. Harold, visibly shaken and struggling to articulate the horror he had witnessed, could only offer a fragmented account. It just. It just took him, he managed to say, his voice barely above a whisper, laden with the weight of what he had seen. What took him, he pressed, his eyes searching Harold's for any clue to the nightmare that had just unfolded. Harold, through tear-streaked eyes, managed only a whisper, his voice breaking under the strain of his fear. The devil, Harold whispers. Ethan and Sophie shared a glance, a silent acknowledgement of the surreal horror that had enveloped them. The silence that fell over the gas station was thick, almost suffocating, as they turned their gaze outward, peering through the glass door into the oppressive darkness of the night. The harsh fluorescent lights of the gas station cast a stark, unforgiving glow on the scene outside, where the normalcy of the pavement was shattered by a single, dark blemish. As they looked on, the bloodstain seemed to grow in significance, morphing from a mere mark to an ominous symbol of the terror that lurked just beyond their temporary haven. It was as if the darkness itself had seeped into the pavement, leaving behind this grim token of Jason's fate, a chilling reminder that what had taken him was still out there, hidden in the shadows, watching, waiting. The night air, thick with an unseasonable chill, pressed against the windows, a force that seemed eager to invade the lit interior of the gas station. The boundary between the safety within and the unknown dangers without became a fragile, transparent barrier, marked only by the glass of the door. Sophie's breath fogged the glass as she leaned closer, her eyes wide with a mix of fear and concern. The tears that stained her cheeks were a stark reminder of the personal loss that the bloodstain represented, yet her gaze was locked on the darkness beyond, as if searching for answers in the void. Ethan stood beside her, his eyes, too, were drawn to the ominous stain, a visual echo of the scream they had all heard, a scream that had been abruptly cut off, leaving behind a silence that was somehow louder than any cry for help. In that moment of shared vulnerability, Ethan acted on a deep-seated instinct of self-preservation. He slowly reaches for the door, and locked it firmly, sealing them inside. Chapter 3 In the stillness that enveloped the gas station, a tense atmosphere had taken hold. Julian, 
the enigmatic Doctor whose sudden appearance had thrown their night into disarray, was now a silent figure in their midst, his labored breathing the only sign of life as he lay on an impromptu bed of scavenged materials. Ethan had tended to Julian's wounds with whatever supplies they could find each makeshift bandage a silent testament to the visceral reality of their situation. The stark realization of their isolation pressed heavily upon the occupants of the gas station. Sophie felt the sting of isolation most acutely, Jason, who had held their only means of communication, had vanished into the night, leaving her adrift in uncertainty and fear. Ethan, too, was cut off, his own phone abandoned, now an unreachable beacon in his vehicle outside. During the initial robbery, Jason's act of destroying Harold's cell phone had severed their only link to the outside world, a cruel blow that left them ensnared in their predicament without hope of contacting the outside for help. Sophie's glances out through the glass door, laden with a mix of hope and dread, were a silent narrative of her inner turmoil. The idea of venturing into the darkness in search of Jason was quashed by the overwhelming fear of what lay beyond the gas station's pool of light. Sophie's mind was a tumultuous sea of emotions, her gaze intermittently drifting out the door through which Jason had abandoned her this night. The bloodstain on the pavement outside served as a grim reminder of the peril that had claimed him, yet it did little to quell the storm of memories and feelings that surged within her. In the silence of the gas station, amidst the tension and fear, Sophie's thoughts wandered back to the beginning, to the moment Jason had entered her life. He had been a beacon of hope, a promise of escape from the oppressive environment of her abusive home. Jason, with his rebellious charm and wild dreams, had made her feel seen, safe, and, most importantly, loved. He was the antidote to her pain, the architect of a new destiny far from the judgmental eyes of her parents and the suffocating walls of her past life. Together, they had been an inseparable duo, Bonnie and Clyde reborn, embarking on a journey towards a dream of freedom and a new beginning in California. Jason had painted a picture of a life filled with adventure and devoid of the constraints that had once held Sophie back. He was her world, her knight in tarnished armor, who had promised to protect and cherish her. But the events of the night had peeled back the layers of the man she thought she knew, revealing a much darker soul beneath the surface. The plan had been simple, a quick robbery to fuel their journey further away from their old lives. Yet, as the situation spiraled out of control, Sophie saw a side of Jason that terrified her. His willingness to endanger others, his abandonment of her, had laid bare the sinister depths of his character. He had left her behind, a decision that stung with the sharpness of betrayal, yet her heart ached for his safety. The conflicting emotions within her painted a portrait of a young woman caught between the idealized love she had known and the harsh reality that now confronted her. As she stood in the gas station, surrounded by strangers who had become unlikely allies, Sophie grappled with her feelings. The memory of Jason's embrace, the dreams they had shared, clashed violently with the image of him as the orchestrator of chaos. In the quiet moments, she sheds a tear and dared to hope for his safety, for a sign that he had somehow escaped the night's horrors unscathed. In a small, self-made refuge in the corner of the gas station, wrapped in a blanket that did little to ward off the chill of fear that had settled deep in his bones, Harold had become a shell of his former self, his interactions with Ethan and Sophie minimal and strained. Words, when they came, were halting and fragmented, the effort to vocalize his thoughts and fears seemingly beyond his capacity. Harold's eyes, wide and unseeing, stared off into the middle distance, fixated on some unseen point that only he could perceive. Occasionally, he would startle at a noise, a sudden movement, or even the silence itself, as if expecting the terror that had claimed Jason to breach the sanctuary of the gas station at any moment. His hands, once steady and capable as he tended to the needs of customers, now trembled uncontrollably, clasping and unclasping as though seeking something solid to anchor him to reality. In the midst of the gas station's tense atmosphere, Ethan found himself adopting a role he hadn't anticipated when the evening began. With Julian's life hanging by a thread and the threat of unknown horrors lurking just beyond their makeshift sanctuary, Ethan's focus was divided between tending to the unconscious doctor and keeping a wary eye on the darkness outside. In a cruel twist of fate, the discovery of Jason's empty pistol added a layer of irony to their plight, a cruel joke at their expense. 
Ethan's soft chuckle at the realization that it had been a bluff before, a brief moment of levity in the face of their grim reality. As Ethan stood vigil by Julian's side, his thoughts were momentarily pulled away from the immediate danger by the cold weight of his wedding ring against his finger. Subconsciously, he found himself twisting the band, a physical manifestation of the turmoil that churned within him. The ring, a symbol of the commitments he had made and now so grievously betrayed, felt heavier in the night's charged atmosphere, its presence a constant reminder of his infidelity. The guilt over his affair, a shadow that had been following him even before the night's events unfolded, seemed to grow more oppressive in the quiet moments between crises. Ethan was acutely aware of the stark contrast between the vows he had taken and the choices he had made, leading him down a path that might now end here, in a gas station surrounded by darkness and danger. His thoughts drifted to his wife, her image a beacon of warmth and love in his mind, and to the unborn child he might never get to meet. The thought of dying without the chance to make amends, to confess his wrongs and seek forgiveness, was a sharp pain that cut deeper than the fear of what lurked outside. Ethan wrestled with the regret and the profound wish for just one more opportunity to right his wrongs, to tell his wife everything and face the consequences of his actions. Despite the uncertainty of the moment and the fear that gripped him, Ethan felt a resolve forming within. If he made it through the night, he would face his mistakes, come what may. The wedding ring, once a simple band of metal, now felt like a lodestone, pulling him towards a future where honesty and atonement were his to claim, should he be given the chance. Changing his focus, Ethan found himself revisiting the discovery he had made earlier in the night. The revolver, which he had uncovered concealed within Julian's coat while tending to the doctor's grave injuries, now lay beside him, a stark reminder of their precarious situation. Ethan picked up the gun once more, its presence a mix of reassurance and burden, symbolizing both the immediate threat outside and the slim hope it offered for their defense. He examined the revolver again, its cool metal surface a contrast to the warmth of his anxious hands. The discovery of the weapon had initially provided a momentary uplift in spirits, a tangible piece of security amidst the chaos. Each of the two bullets it housed was precious, representing a critical chance at defending themselves against the unknown horrors that had already claimed Jason. As Ethan's gaze lingered on Julian's still form, he couldn't help but ponder the mysteries that surrounded the unconscious man. Julian was an enigma, his sudden arrival laden with unanswered questions and the revolver adding a layer of complexity to his already puzzling presence. Ethan found himself caught between viewing Julian as a potential ally in their struggle for survival and considering the possibility that there was more to the doctor's story than met the eye. The revolver, now a symbol of their fragile hope, rested heavily in Ethan's grasp. He was acutely aware of the responsibility that came with it. The weapon was their lifeline, a means to protect the small, makeshift family that had formed in the face of adversity. Yet, the questions surrounding Julian's character and intentions remained, casting a shadow of doubt over the relief Ethan felt at having the gun. As the uneasy silence of the gas station stretched on, it was suddenly shattered by a sound from outside that sent chills through everyone inside. It was a deep, guttural growl, unlike anything they had heard before, resonating with a primal terror that seemed to vibrate the very glass of the windows. Harold, already teetering on the edge of despair from the night's earlier horrors, began to rock back and forth where he sat, his arms wrapped tightly around his knees. Muffled pleas escaped his lips, a litany of pleas, no more, as he begged for the terrifying sounds to cease. Ethan, despite his resolve, felt a jolt of fear lance through him at the sound. Instinctively, his hand tightened around the revolver, the cold metal a small comfort against the growing dread. Standing up, he scanned the lit interior of the gas station, every shadow suddenly seeming deeper, every corner potentially harboring unseen dangers. His attention was quickly drawn to Sophie, who stood frozen near the door, her gaze locked on something in the darkness beyond the gas station's lights. Concern etched into his features, Ethan approached her slowly, his steps cautious. Sophie, what is it? he asked, his voice soft but edged with worry. Sophie, seemingly caught in the grip of the terror outside, was silent. Her arm extended toward the night, her finger pointing with a mechanical rigidity at something unseen. 
Following her gaze with a growing sense of dread, Ethan peered into the darkness, searching for what had captured her attention so completely. Then he saw them, two glowing red eyes pulsating in the shadows just beyond the reach of the gas station's lights. The sight of those eyes, so full of malevolence and hunger, sent an icy fear spiraling through Ethan. He gripped the revolver tighter, as if the weapon could somehow shield them from the creature that lurked in the darkness, watching, waiting. What is that? Ethan whispered, more to himself than to Sophie, his voice barely audible over the pounding of his heart. Death, a weak voice whispers. Ethan and Sophie whirled around, their fear amplified by Julian's unexpected words. As they stood there, caught between the creature outside and Julian's ominous warning, the gas station felt more like a trap than ever before, a fragile bubble of safety that could burst at any moment. Chapter 4 In the eerie stillness of the gas station, an uneasy alliance had formed between Ethan and Sophie as they rallied to care for Julian, whose life seemed to hang by a thread. The monstrous presence outside was momentarily forgotten, their focus narrowing to the man whose secrets might hold the key to their survival. Fetching a bottle of water with deliberate care, Sophie handed it to Ethan, her movements betraying a deep-seated anxiety. Ethan, grateful for the gesture, supported Julian, helping him to sip the water. Julian's response was a series of wrenching coughs, each one a stark reminder of his critical condition. In a brief lull of calm amidst the storm of fear, Sophie's curiosity broke through. You a doctor? She inquired, her voice a mix of wonder and distraction from the terror that lay beyond their walls. No. Ethan chuckles offered a weary smile, a touch of warmth in the cold tension. I learned from my wife. She's a nurse, he shared, the pride in his voice momentarily lifting the heavy air around them. Julian's attempt to speak cut through their exchange, his voice frail but insistent. I'm not going to make it, he rasped, a grim acceptance in his tone. Wonder if any of us will, Sophie mused darkly, her voice laced with skepticism looking over her shoulder at Harold. Ethan's hand found Sophie's shoulder, a silent offer of reassurance. We'll make it, he insisted, trying to infuse hope into the bleak atmosphere. Sophie's reaction was dismissive, a sharp whatever that spoke volumes of her dwindling faith. She shrugged off his hand, distancing herself from the conversation and the fragile hope Ethan clung to. Returning his attention to Julian, Ethan was met with the doctor's laboured confession. This is my fault, Julian whispered. Sophie's patience snapped. No shit, she retorted bitterly, her anger finding an outlet. We should have thrown you out to that thing. Ethan's frustration boiled over. Enough, Sophie. That's not helping, he snapped, his voice tinged with anger and desperation. Sophie, taken aback by his intensity, retreated with a scoff, her defiance clear as she stood up with arms crossed but saying nothing. It's a chimera, Julian rasped, each word punctuated by labored breaths. A what? Both Ethan and Sophie ask in unison. It's a creation of science twisted into a nightmare. Designed for military use. To infiltrate and destroy. It's the perfect predator. Ethan's gaze and Sophie's met in fear as Julian's revelations painted a terrifying picture. We thought we could control it, use it as a weapon. But it was far more than we anticipated. It learns, adapts. It's not just any creature, it's a culmination of the deadliest aspects of multiple predators, engineered for stealth and lethality. Sophie, her face filled with anger, interjected, but why? Why create something so... monstrous? Julian coughed, a spatter of blood marring his lips as Ethan hastily wiped it away. Pride. Arrogance, he admitted. We wanted to push the boundaries of what was possible, to create the ultimate soldier. But we didn't anticipate its will to survive, its desire for freedom. It's my greatest achievement. And my most profound regret. His confession was a raw, unvarnished truth, a scientist coming to terms with the consequences of his actions. The room fell into a heavy silence as the weight of Julian's words settled over them. 
The chimera, a being born from the darkest pits of human ambition, was a terror unleashed, its existence a testament to man's folly. Ethan, finding his voice, asked the question that hung heavily in the air, how do we stop it? Is it even possible? Julian's eyes, dim with the encroaching shadow of death, flickered with a hint of resolve. My gun. It contains two bullets filled with a specialized poison. Ethan, still grappling with the knight's revelations, looked at the gun in his hands with newfound wariness. Poison? How quickly does it work? A wry, pain chuckle escaped Julian blood mixed with his spit. You mean if you can hit it, he said, blood tinting his words. Ethan, absorbing the gravity of Julian's instructions, felt the enormity of the task before them. The chimera wasn't just a creature of the night, it was a symbol of human error, a living weapon that now hunted them. The silence that enveloped the gas station, heavy with the dread of Julian's revelations, was abruptly shattered by Harold's scream. The clerk, who had been lost in his own world of fear, was suddenly animated by pure terror, his body shaking violently as he pointed towards the front door. His face, a mask of horror, was frozen in an expression that spoke volumes of the nightmare unfolding before their eyes. In an instinctive response, Sophie and Ethan left Julian's side, moving cautiously toward the door. Ethan's grip on the pistol tightened, the weight of the weapon a small reassurance against the fear that clawed at his chest. He recalled Julian's last words, the poison-filled bullets their only hope against the chimera. As they rounded the corner, what they saw defied any expectation, any semblance of reality they had clung to. There, in full view for the first time, stood the chimera. It was a creature of nightmares, its body a grotesque parody of nature's design. Its dark velvet purple skin seemed to absorb the light, while bony spikes jutted menacingly from its spine, casting sinister shadows. The tail, ending in a scorpion-like sting, twitched with lethal intent. Its face, a distorted visage of terror, bore solid blood-red eyes that seemed to pierce the soul, and as its mouth opened, a forked tongue flickered between rows of razor-sharp teeth with fangs of a snake glistening in the front. What the hell are you? Ethan breathed out, his voice a mix of awe and horror. Without warning, the chimera's demeanor shifted. Its stance became deliberate, focused, as its eyes began pulsating, shifting from a deep red to an eerie light blue. The spikes along its back started to glow with the same blue hue, flickering rapidly as if charging with an unseen energy. In that moment, time seemed to stand still. Sophie, Ethan, and even Harold, caught in a trance, could only watch in stunned silence as the impossible unfolded before them. The creature, a living embodiment of science gone mad, was unlike anything they had ever conceived. Then, as the flickering reached a frenetic pace, the chimera's mouth opened wide in a roar that was not just a sound but a physical force. Ethan's instincts kicked in with startling clarity. In a split-second decision, he grabbed Sophie, pulling her down to the ground with him, just as the chimera exploded in a blinding blue light. The light, intense and all-consuming, functioned like an EMP, shorting out every electronic device in and around the gas station. Sparks flew as lights burst, and the glass door, the fragile barrier between them and the chimera, shattered into a thousand pieces, erasing the last line of defense they had against the creature. In the aftermath of the chimera's blinding assault, the inhabitants of the gas station found themselves amidst a landscape of destruction with the moon's soft glow casting long shadows across the interior of the gas station now littered with glass. Harold, paralyzed by his fear, was reduced to a trembling figure, unable to scream or move, overwhelmed by the unfolding terror. The tense silence was abruptly broken by a menacing growl emanating from the shattered doorway. The chimera, unimpeded by what used to be a protective barrier, made its entrance, its steps echoing ominously on the glass-strewn floor. Ethan and Sophie, rooted to the spot, could only watch as the embodiment of their nightmares approached, each step a deliberate prelude to their potential end. Realization dawned on Ethan in a heart-stopping moment, he had lost his grip on the revolver in the chaos. Oh shit, he muttered under his breath, a sense of dread washing over him. Sophie, catching his panic-stricken look, quickly spotted the gun resting near a shelf. 
With urgency, she tapped Ethan, silently signaling the location of their last hope. The chimera advanced slowly, its bared fangs a grotesque display of its predatory intent, as if savoring the fear it induced in its prey. The realization that they couldn't possibly outrun the creature to retrieve the gun and survive its attack settled in with chilling clarity. Ethan, making a split-second decision, clutched Sophie, grabbing her full attention. Grab the gun and don't miss, he whispered, a desperate strategy forming in his mind. Without waiting for her response, Ethan diverted the chimera's attention with a bold challenge, sprinting away in a bid to draw it from Sophie. The chimera reacted with lethal swiftness, its hiss filling the air as it pounced on Ethan. The force of the attack drove him to the ground, the chimera's claws tearing through his shirt and into his flesh. Ethan's scream was one of pure agony, his mind flooding with images of his wife, his regret palpable in his final moments. As he braced for the end, expecting to feel the chimera's teeth close around him, the silence was pierced by two gunshots. The weight of the chimera suddenly became dead and heavy atop him. Astonishingly, he was still alive. Struggling under the chimera's bulk, Ethan looked up to see Sophie, the revolver steady in her hands, her expression a mix of shock and determination. Damn, that poison works fast, she remarked, a hint of disbelief in her voice. Ethan's laughter, though strained with pain, was genuine, a release of tension and fear. Help me get this heavy thing off me, he gasped, relief washing over him as Sophie approached to assist. Together, they managed to push the lifeless chimera off Ethan, their shared laughter a defiant echo in the wake of their ordeal. They had been giving a second chance at life tonight and both Sophie and Ethan knew they should not waste it. The End